good. Okay. All right. Um, I just need to make it work. I'll go back again. Okay. Um, the central characteristics of the current e epoch for which, uh, which for the time being we can refer to as the Anthropocene, include a sense of crisis and emergency, as well as widespread feelings of fear, crisis, anxiety, loss of control. In a paper uh, discussed earlier in the Centre's seminar series, Sihard, you and, and Martina Hasenfratz highlight the high degree of emotionality characterising the conflicts and arguments surrounding environmental issues. Now, in his book, Down to Earth, Bruno Latour writes, in other words, the sense of vertigo, almost of panic, that traverses all contemporary politics arise owing to the fact that the ground is giving way between, beneath everyone's feet all at once, as if we feel attacked everywhere in our habits and our possessions. The concept of sustainability has become central to our understanding of humanity's future for the simple reason that it's entirely possible that our current societies, economies and polities can no longer be sustained by the earth that we inhabit, that things just don't add up, that sooner or later the bill will have to be paid. This was already the case in relation to global warming, the migration crisis, the sixth extinction, increasing inequality, the spread of precarity, and so on, let alone the spread of post-democracy. It's only been accentuated by the coronavirus pandemic, which has underlined not only the interdependence between human beings around the world, but also the interdependence between human beings and microorganisms, in turn, an aspect of our interdependence with animals and the land. Now, Latour, reflecting on the need to develop new kinds of stories about ourselves in the current state of suspense, as he calls it, notes the need to look unblinkingly at our situation. And he refers to Edgar Allan Poe's short story, A Descent into the Maelstrom. Now, most of you probably know the story, but very quickly it runs as follows. There's three fishermen, brothers out in their boat, who find themselves caught in a particularly powerful maelstrom or whirlpool. The boat is getting sucked deeper and deeper underwater. Fisherman A gets swept overboard. Things aren't looking good. Fisherman B and C are concentrating on avoiding their brother's fate and lashing themselves to the boat. Fisherman C, however, notices that smaller objects, especially cylindrical ones, appear to be sucked down much more slowly than the larger ones. So he has this detached observation of what's going on. Let's tie ourselves to a cask and jump out, he says. We've got a much better chance that way. Fisherman B thinks it's a crazy idea. Fisherman C jumps out, lashed to his water cask, and he survives, but Fisherman B doesn't. Now, I was struck by Latour's reference to Poe's story because it's a favourite of Norbert Elias's in explaining how social science research and theory should be approached. He used this short story to illustrate the importance of intellectual but also emotional detachment in thinking about the world around us especially, but not only, when things appear dangerous or threatening. In order properly to understand all the issues surrounding the concept of sustainability, crises like, like the coronavirus and so on, it may be useful then to take a few steps back and work out some principles for a position that is sensitive to the ways in which questions surrounding the futures of sustainability need to be addressed in terms of the fundamental characteristics of social, political and economic life. The coronavirus problem can be seen then as one more aspect of a constellation of sustainability issues surrounding the relationship between human beings and their natural environment, including energy consumption and production, global warming, human-animal relations, urbanisation, food production and consumption, travel and mobility, deforestation and habitat destruction, declining biodiversity and species extinction. You can see the list is a long one. The kinds of industrialised food production linked to infectious disease, for example, are also precisely those contributing significantly to global warming. Now, Elias is best known for his arguments concerning how human civilization should be understood as a long-term process of ever-lengthening chains of interdependence and power relations, binding people together in constantly shifting power relations. He argued that there are three levels or registers of analysis required. First, the relationship between humans and the non-human environment. Second, their relationships with each other. And third, their relationships with themselves. 
He shared the view held by early other early sociologists that social relations structures and processes are closely tied to people's psychological and emotional dispositions and orientations, or to use his word there, habitus. There are three ideas about how to think about the state of suspense we're currently in that can be drawn from Elias's approach to sociology. They're not the only ones, but they're the ones I'd like to focus on today and that I'd like to highlight here. First, in fact, this is a lot, an old story, the, the coronavirus pandemic, in the sense that we're in the middle of a constellation of long-term processes, and this matters in a number of ways. Second, human civilization is both a cause and part of the solution to the problems that we're facing. And third, the causes, sorry, the causes, effects and possible responses to sustainability um, uh, issues are tightly bound, bound up with the kind of persons that we are with the formation of human subjectivity. By taking these three ideas into consideration, it becomes possible to see um, a much wider range of conceptual linkages between different um, theoretical approaches to um, all these kinds of issues. Now, the first one, the, the problem of long-term processes, um, in considering what sustainable development might look like, an important question is, what are the long-term processes in social relations and in relations between humans and the non-human world within which issues of sustainability are embedded? We're very much caught up in the present moment and the immediate future, understandably and for some purposes correctly. But our thinking and activity also needs to be informed by an understanding of how our current experience is bound up with particular lines of development and evolution concerning the relationships between and among humans, animals, energy sources, microorganisms and the environment. This is not simply a matter of learning from history in the sense of noting the similarities between how previous environmental problems like plague, natural disasters, climate change or famines were managed and how we're dealing with similar problems today. A historically informed approach means something more complicated. It should include an analysis of the place that such environmental problems occupied in relation to prevailing social relations and structures in different historical contexts. The aim should be to identify the conceptual implications of both the similarities and the differences. And this will lead us to, uh, to direct greater attention to aspects of the social context of sustainability issues that might otherwise remain in the background. We need a well-grounded historical understanding in order to require an accurate sense of what kind of predicament we're currently in and why it should be approached not as a relatively short-term crisis, but as the latest stage of a long-term, of a set of long-term processes that are deeply embedded in the social, political and economic structures that we take for granted. This then requires a much more fundamental kind of response and um, a much more fundamental changes of direction in the way we respond to these issues. The list of aspects of social life that are increasing, expanding, intensifying and becoming more complex includes population density, urbanisation, industrialised food production, um, human, humans' proximity to each other and to the animal world, the extent and speed of human movement around the world, constituting the possible distribution networks for infection, and the drivers of CO2 emission. I'd like to focus on the particular example of pandemics and the coronavirus, because until this year, the question of infectious disease has had a relatively low profile in debates around sustainability. There are also aspects of how this problem is understood that can be applied to a wide variety of other sustainability issues, albeit imperfectly. Right, so you can translate the way we think about the coronavirus into other, other kinds of issues. Most analyses of pandemics agree that they're closely tied to a number of ongoing processes of change and transformation that are moving in particular directions. John McNeil makes the general point that ecological history is tightly bound up with social history, that you can't really do one without the other. The current COVID-19 situation is the latest point in a very long-term evolving relationship between humans, animals, the environment and microorganisms. Some parallels have been drawn with the 1918 flu pandemic, but there is a much longer term history of the role of infectious disease in human affairs. 
generally, it's generally underestimated the extent to which human history has revolved around our relationship to disease. William McNeil's 1976 book, Plagues and Peoples, highlighted the ways in which plagues and pandemics are not factors external to the historical development of human society, but lie at its heart, often working to accelerate existing processes of change. His initial illustrative example was Hernando Cortez's vanquishment of the Aztec Empire with a force of only 600 men, but accompanied with a super weapon annihilating pretty well everyone in its path, smallpox. So disease and its control has been central to processes of modernization, civilization and state formation. For example, the demographic collapse resulting from the bubonic plague can be seen as playing a key role in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. The impact of microorganisms was closely tied to the emergence of money and market economies, and especially the expansion of global economic activity, if only as a carrier for microbes. So the French historian Leroy Ladurie argues that infectious diseases were among the more significant early mechanisms of globalization. And he refers to the unification of the globe by disease and the creation of a global common market of disease between the 14th and the 16th centuries. So a long-term perspective highlights the ways in which there is always a tension, a tension between increasing social solidarity in dealing with the presenting problem as a communally shared problem and increasing social division and conflict between those who are affected by it in different ways. If you look at other writers like Jason Moore, um, a long-term perspective also highlights the ways in which sustainability crises are not the product of relations between humans and the non-human world or a culture and society um, relationship to nature, um, that the limits um, that are being imposed are not being imposed from the outside of capitalist economic development. He argues that rather the limits to growth are internal to the system of value creation that humans have been working, um, have been working with since 1450, dependent on seeing and finding ever new sources of cheap energy, raw materials, labor power and food. And he uses the concept of the frontier to, um, to capture the way in which capitalism as a value creation system has relied on finding those kind of cheap sources of, of, of labor power, energy and so on. In a way, his uh, picture of capitalism is, is a, of a giant Ponzi scheme, right? That's always kind of running ahead of, 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 its, of its income and its inputs, and it's constantly having to find new ways of paying its bills. Now, in relation to why we should use a term like the civilizing process to talk about, you know, what what's key about these long term um, lines of development, it's important to be more precise about what kind of long term processes deserve the most attention. You could use terms like modernization or rationalization, but the word civilization is also one that frequently gets used in some parts of the literature. Again, in relation to infectious disease, but this is also relevant for other issues. In contrast to the tendency to think of microorganisms and infectious diseases as external threats to human civilization, there's now an extensive body of research examining the ways in which the developmental pathways of the two are in reality closely intertwined. So there's one writer, Carl Harper, um, who, um, who draws attention to the role of disease in the fall of the Roman Empire, remarking that the rise and fall of Rome remind us that the story of human civilization is through and through an environmental drama. However, the term civilization is heavily loaded, and it's important to be explicit about what meaning is being attached to it. In my view, the most useful approach to the term is to avoid seeing it simply as a state of affairs constituting progress advancement, cultivation, refinement, and so on, that one then contrasts with barbarism. It's also important to make it a bit more meaningful than simply equating it with culture in the sense of clash of civilizations or civilizational analysis. There are three aspects of Elias's conception which take us beyond either of these meanings. First, that civilization should be understood not as a state of affairs or a condition, but as a long-term developmental process. 
with an identifiable logic and grammar. Second, that what we experience both positively and negatively as the process of civilization is all about shifting forms of interdependence. Elias often used expressions like gradually lengthening chains of interdependence. And those lengthening chains of interdependence all are constituted by um, equally changing power relations. Third, that one needs to be conscious of the distinction between the civilizing process and civilizing missions or offensives. They are not the same thing. And I'm emphasizing this because the two terms often get used interchangeably. And um, I think that's actually a misunderstanding of the way um, Elias is approaching the topic. His concept of a process is not really the same as that of a civilizing mission or a civilizing um, offensive. The two have a complex relationship with each other. Civilizing processes often generate problems that civilizing missions attempt to resolve, and civilizing missions often have problematic effects that are only gradually shifted or undone as the civilizing process unfolds. And by that I mean increasing, intensifying um, social interdependence. Now, um, there's a connection here between what Elias is concerned with and uh, what's been understood as convivialism. And I mentioned that because we've talked about this um, in the past in the, uh, the Centre's seminar series. And I'll just use it as a way of, of illustrating what um, Elias is talking about. Um, when you look at the convivialist manifesto, there's this passage in it. They say, although humanity has made enormous technical and scientific progress, it has still not been able to solve its biggest problem how to deal with rivalry and violence between people, how to get them to work together, each giving the best of themselves so that it becomes possible to contradict each other without massacring each other, how to prevent today's limitless and potentially self-destructive accumulation of power over people and nature. Now, what's important for me about that passage is that these are all long-term processes, right? The way in which we have come to deal with rivalry and, and violence um, without um, actually um, massacring each other is something that has been at issue throughout the whole civilizing process and Elias has his own arguments about how, how you understand that which I haven't got time to go into now. The point is that, that, that there is a long-term history to these issues that the convivialist manifesto is trying to engage with. So Elias's analytical concern is precisely how the engagement with this problem has developed over time. His theory is above all a theory of the knock-on effects of increasing and intensifying forms of social and interpersonal interdependence. And to my mind, this concept needs to be at the centre of our approach to any understanding of sustainability. It's always been precisely the achievements of the civilising process that have generated new problems of sustainability. And you see this really clearly in William McNeil's book, right? He, he often talks about that it's been it's been precisely you know the move to settled agriculture that, that has encouraged the um the emergence of plagues and pandemics the workings of the process of civilization are highly contradictory generating new problems as soon as old ones are addressed and again william mcneil has the strongest version of this argument he talks about the law of the conservation of catastrophe he says the increasing complexity of social, economic and political relations resulting from the resolution of one kind of problem regularly generates new vulner vulnerability to another one. He says it seems clear to me that the more successful a group of human beings is in avoiding catastrophe by using their powers of organisation, foresight and calculation, the greater become the catastrophes they invite by colliding with similarly organised and managed human groups. So it's become apparent that, he, that the increased control that human beings have over the natural world is itself what needs to be controlled, requiring a new form of meta-control, or I've, I've thought of the term of a meta-civilising process, right? So the, the whole um, um, the mechanism of the civilising process themselves need to be civilised. Now, I found the work of the Dutch sociologist um, Kees Schmidt very useful here. This is a relatively unknown article, but I think it's very good. He refers to the um, interwoven processes of economisation and 
ecologization. For Schmidt, the spread of the logic of the market and an orientation to economic rationality, what um, Jason Moore would call wealth creation based on the four cheaps, is central to the civilizing process, to the intensifying patterns of social interdependence. But the same is true of ecologization, the increasing responsiveness to environmental concerns often seen as an opponent of economization. So degrowth is often seen as, as trying to um, develop an argument that's, that, that's opposing um, an emphasis on the economy. In fact, ecologization is dependent on particular developments in how economic activity is understood, which are no less a part of the long-term economization process. The logic of sustainability is as much an economic as an ecological one. You can see this already in the shifts to market activity towards renewable energy, the divestment of investment in fossil fuels and so on. Um, to some extent, this is contrary to um, Polanyi's understanding of the relationship between economy and society. Um, and Frank Adeloff's also talked about this um, in one of his articles. And I'd like to draw your attention too to a book by Martin Koenigs, uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Sydney, called The Emotional Logic of Capitalism, which also develops these kinds of arguments. The next point is, uh, the third point is the one about subjectivity and habitus and the formation of, of, our, of ourselves as persons, right? Because Elias also insists that the process of civilization should be seen as characterized by transformations, sometimes gradual, sometimes in spurts um, uh, and, and, and sudden kind of shifts of psychological and emotional dispositions, lifestyles and norms. It's characterized by a shift in the balance between external and internal constraints towards the latter. He used the term habitus to capture the sense of internalized, automatic, unconscious and habitual modes of conduct in a way similar to Weber and Durkheim. One of his um, favorite examples is time discipline, right? The way in which over, over time we've come to um, become almost automatically orientated to, to, um, to the use of watches and other, other means of telling the time to, organize, to, to coordinate our relationships with each other. And that was an important kind of historical achievement in the way in which human beings related to each other. Um, throughout his work, the management of interpersonal aggression and violence is a central aspect of the civilizing process as well. Um, and he talks about the, over time, the courtization of warriors, right? So the transformation of people orientated towards physical violence, towards um, much more complex kind of ways of interrelating, using language and behavior and so on to relate to each other. Now, if the arguments for sustainable development appear to be compelling everyone, to paraphrase Marx and Engels, to face with sober senses their real conditions of life and their relations with each other, this compulsion has significant emotional, psychological and moral dimensions. An important dimension of how all environmental issues take shape and get responded to is that of human psychological and emotional dispositions. So what aspects of human habitus have contributed to sustainability problems and what changes in habitus might need to take place to address them? What is it about the kind of persons that we are that underpin um, current sustainability issues, global warming, the coronavirus and so on, and how do we need to change to try and address those problems? For example, population movement has played a key role in the transmission of infectious disease moving along trade routes and following the movements of merchants, soldiers and travellers. And of course, in the generation of CO2 emissions, mobility and extensive tourism have become central to many people's sense of what it means to be a worthwhile human being, to be recognised properly by their social network. Even among those most willing to alter their consumption habits in recognition of environmental issues, travel has been stubbornly resistant to any adjustment. And I include myself in that population. While it may enhance one's cultural capital to insist on cycling or using public transport as much as possible to conversion to an electric car, 
to be recycling diligently, to consume only organically grown vegetables and free range animal products, or to install solar power. Those who look askance at overseas holidays, work trips or conferences because of the environmental impact of air travel remain in the minority. Although, of course, the, the COVID situation has changed that significantly and the very fact we're, we're doing this by, um, by Zoom and having it recorded as a, webinar, as a webinar is an example of what's changing in that field. But that's only been imposed on us by the coronavirus pandemic. So the general point here is that our relationship to the non-human world is closely tied to our relationship to ourselves. So Elias said this about it. In actual fact, by transforming nature, people transform themselves. The integration of humans with other humans and the integration of humans with the non-human features of nature are inseparable. They represent, as it were, two levels of one and the same process. The measures advocated in relation to any sustainability issues by public health experts in relation to COVID-19, those concerned about global warming or the form taken by human-animal relations requires a certain kind of psychological and emotional disposition, a particular transformation of the kind of person we are as well as our relations with others. A particular normative orientation of the world such um, such that um, environmental values and the individuals who conform to them are prioritised in relation to other values. This has been clear in relation to environmental issues generally. Being conscious of one's impact on the environment requires additional foresight, planning, adjustment of one's habits of consumption, travel, social interaction and everyday life. Above all, sustainable development requires a particular kind of cognitive disposition an increasing degree of foresight, of orientation to the long-term future, which Elias always saw as central to the transformation of individual um, habitus arising from the lengthening chains of interdependence and the associated shifting power relations. Now, just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, there's, um, there's a page in the book Limits to Growth, which came out, what, I can't remember now, 1972, something like that, which gives you an illustration of this. Right? Um, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but essentially they're um, trying to outline um, the way in which um, different kinds of perspectives on time and um, on the kind of um, ex extent of one's social network um, relate to the way in which the limits to growth argument is perceived. Right? So on the left hand side, it's about having um, moving from a relatively narrow social network to a wide one. So it goes from family to the whole world. right? And then um, the x axis is the time axis. And that talks about um, how orientated one is to the present or the future and how far into the future one is orientated. Right? So um, um, the more orientated one is towards the future, the more one kind of moves along the x-axis to, to go from next week to the next few years, to one's own lifetime, to one's children's lifetime. Um, and um, on the y-axis, it goes from the family um, through to the world. And they're highlighting the fact that um, the further you go along um, both of these axes, the fewer people there are. Right? So the, most people in the world are, um, have a, a relatively short-term time perspective and a relatively um, narrow sense of their social network and who they identify with and the whole problem they saw in terms of, of, of getting across the ideas of limits to growth is to try and shift people along both of those axes so that um, they have a longer time frame and they have a broader sense of the social network that we're, that we're part of. Now in relation to COVID-19 you can see this clearly in relation to how people live with lockdown conditions, isolation in hotel quarantine, physical distancing, etiquette around coughing and sneezing generally, as well as the use of masks and the use of hand, hand sanitizer, all of which require a greater level of foresight, self-awareness and, and, and self-regulation. And they require um, a sense of the long-term effects of, of one's activities and a willingness to take that um, into account in regulating one's own behaviour. 
but really it applies to any aspect of what a post carbon society might look like or what a sustainable society and economy might look like. This also has a dimension of status and social distinction, constituting a form of social and cultural capital that individuals are either attracted to or inclined to resist. So current contestations around the use of masks in public is a clear example. The issue is not really one of rational assessment of their efficacy, but one of manners and etiquette. Is this the correct way to behave? Should I feel ashamed if I don't wear a mask? For, for many people, the answer to that is hell no. Should individual freedom to feel comfortable wearing particular kinds of clothing outweigh an obligation to consider other people? The reaction of many anti-mask people has been visceral, right? It's been, it's been almost kind of embodied, a physical and emotional reaction to having restrictions placed on their bodies and the willingness to internalize um, an, an unfamiliar bodily discipline only gets established un partic under particular social conditions. Other examples of the same kind of problem would be smoking, drink driving and seatbelts, right? And it'd be useful to actually um, um, undertake a kind of comparison of the way those different kind of issues ha have been dealt with over time. A key issue here is, is, is the question of mutual identification, right? The extent to which people identify with other human beings um, in, in a wider kind of network um, and, and, and actually see their experiences as being part of their own. The transformations of habitus underpinning the process of civilization have a momentum and force that needs to be understood as independent of the particular response to the various concerns like global warming, habitat destruction and species extinction. I, I really need to emphasize that. In relation to public health, for example, the Dutch sociologists um, Halsblom and Schmidt argued that the shifts in sentiment and conduct associated with public health crises are not the result of direct responses to issues, but driven by other types of concerns to do with etiquette, with status, with distinction, with social recognition and acceptance. Sustainability issues, sustainability and sustainability concerns from Elias's perspective then stand for or represent more a more generalized capacity for self-restraint, a shaping of habitus in a particular direction that has more to do with the structure and dynamics of social relations more broadly than the solution to specific environmental or public health problems. Now, none of this discussion leads to any particular program of action, so I can't offer you that. But hopefully it does spell out some important parameters for the kind of detached assessment of our practices and institutions that are needed to inform an effective engagement with the suite of issues confronting the world today. What the long-term histories of thinkers like William McNeil, John McNeil, Jason Moore, Elias, you could include um, Wallerstein, um, Brodell, the, those kind of um, long-term historians and many others remind us of the crisis that the crises we're experiencing today are very deeply embedded in the social, political and economic forms to which we're strongly attached. Having been developed to work successfully in particular environments that are now rapidly changing. So Jason Moore um, suggests that the whole essentially unsustainable system of value creation that has structured most of the globe's economy and sociability since 1450 based on the constant rediscovery of new frontiers of cheap energy, labor, raw materials and food has reached a point of exhaustion. It is no longer clear where the new resource frontiers required to revive global capital accumulation are to be found, other than the expansion of modern slavery and other forms of forced labor, the deep ocean and the Arctic and the Antarctic, other planets, and perhaps even the turn to renewable energy itself is a, a manifestation of this. So he argues that rather than beginning of the Anthropocene, and this is why I was cautious about using the word um, at the beginning of this talk, he argued that we're now in fact at the end of the, the capitalocene, right? and that that's a more appropriate kind of term to use. 
Now, if Morse correct, then the world is in for a rough ride and a great deal of detachment is going to be required because it's quite unclear and, and Moore doesn't actually have terribly useful um, proposals for solving this problem, then it's not clear exactly where we're going to be going. But generally, the processes of civilization and globalization that have characterized human history have generated types of demography and forms of mobility, urban living, food production and consumption, as well as energy production and consumption that need in turn to be subjected to increasing control and regulation. In fact, subjected to a meta civilizing process. So I'll, I'll reiterate that point that civilization itself requires civilizing. Finally, um, the, the final point that I'd like to make is that such meta-civilizing processes will only be organized around rational reflection to a limited extent. In significant ways, it will be constituted by shifts at the emotional and psychological level in the realm of culture and habitus, by the formation of particular ways of being a person, and any changes at the level of social institutions and forms will remain relatively insignificant in the absence of changes at that level as well. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.